Hey guys, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Digital Artcast. Um, I want to say uh, howdy to all you guys who are tuning in for the first time, and welcome back to the rest of you who are, you know, uh, long time subscribers or people who've been listening for a while uh, also. Um, these episodes are, are great, and I'm kind of powering on, trying to do as many as I can and talk to as many different artists as I can. Um, but of course, uh, the recent events in, in the US and stuff are making it a bit more difficult to get a hold of certain people so um, I thought I'd swing over this side of the pond today and uh, try and speak to uh, one of our, our European brethren um, and uh, I just want to also say quickly before we get into it that um, uh, I'm very supportive of the, um, the movement that's going on in America just now and I just want to say to all my American brethren that I hope you guys are well and staying safe out there. Um, I know these are very trying times, um, but we uh, we definitely stand with you on the podcast. Um, so anyway, so yeah, moving back to our guest today, um, this particular guest is someone that caught my eye uh, a while back uh, and managed to bump into him uh, a couple of years back in Paris during the IMAG uh, festival. It was getting held there and uh, yeah, just wanted to get him on for a while and talk about his process and his career. Um, so please let me introduce, uh, I hope I'm going to get this right, uh, Sama van Klaarbergen. Yeah, that's pretty close. <sighs> yeah, okay. The closest I'm going to get, I think, is that, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't want to have another attempt, but yeah, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I didn't butcher it too much. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Sama, for coming on. Thank you for, uh, for giving up your time to talk to us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so yeah, so we kind of, I mean, we, we didn't obviously talk at length or anything, but you know, we were in the kind of same vicinity um, during the, the IMAG Festival in 2018. Um, I think the first time I kind of caught a glimpse of you, you were on the, the stairs at the moment, you were kind of showing off, it was uh, either your portfolio or a, an art book you had put together, was it something of that description? Oh yeah, so what I used to do when I was going to events was make a, kind of a booklet with my my portfolio in it right yeah so i could show show people in in some kind of a like a high quality standard right instead of just showing my phone right yeah, so i was probably showing that all yeah. right okay yeah that probably makes sense so yeah so i mean the last couple of years have been crazy busy for you i mean you've been you know afforded some great opportunities to work for some amazing companies um which of course we'll dive into eventually but um you know it all started from where you're from at the moment you're, you're still in uh, the Netherlands at the moment, right? You're still working from there? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I work from my home office right now. I used to have a, a little office like where I would bike to, uh, but I've always been working from this distance, yeah. Right, okay, cool. And then, uh, so you traditionally, you went to school for art specifically, right? Well, um, I went to a school which wasn't really art focused. It was called Communication Systems. And it was very, very broad. So I would I would learn about like a ton of visual things and mostly about communication and I could make websites and, and stuff and videos. Uh, but I didn't learn my, my skill set there. Right. So it was more design focused then? Yeah, basically it was, it was focused on, uh, the thinking behind any kind of communication. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think I've done something similar before I went to do 3d animation. I actually went to, uh, a course and it was called visual communication and it was specifically uh graphic and web design that was like what we were kind of getting taught but then yeah exactly yeah it's, it's very similar to that yeah 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 so that was that, yeah but i did switch luckily to the 3d stuff um but now of course i'm doing some concept illustration stuff but yeah i, I think we, i had this this question yesterday on stream when people were talking about if I went to school for, for what I did, but then it was funny how I said, yeah, I went to school, but <laughs> I didn't learn specifically the skills of what I'm doing. Yeah, just yet. So exactly. it's, uh, it's very, very common because even I think, you know, the, the UK and Scotland probably suffer from it, but I think a lot of European countries, including uh, Netherlands are the same is that, you know, there isn't any, uh, there isn't a lot of schools that will teach specifically industry mm -hmm. standard uh, skill sets. Yeah. I think there is maybe one ish in, in uh in the Netherlands where they, they they do entertainment design in some form i don't know if that's the same one york and leon went to um but i know they have like some specifics but then it's not like widespread right it's not like something you can go to multiple schools for yeah exactly i think uh leon went to a bit better a school was a bit better uh my school was basically just the basics and, and i think most most artists i know that went to a, a school of a similar sort they actually they they realized they didn't know enough 
when they finished. So they had to keep going and learn on their own. Right. And those people are the ones that are, I think, most successful now. Yeah, of course, definitely. I think it's 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 almost a double-edged sword of this industry where it's great that you can stride your own path and learn your own skills, uh, you know, on your own and, and, and forge your own path in the industry. But I do feel that there's a lack of education that really needs to meet the standards of the industry. And I know it's because the industry moves so fast, but there is plenty of skills out there that are progressively trying to keep up with the industry yeah. um, and and do that, you know, like guys like Brainstorm, Learn Squared, a lot of online stuff, yeah. CGMA, but, um, but then it's unfortunate, I think, the times we went to school, you know, a lot of that stuff was just getting started. I mean, I think Art Station only became a thing in 2014 mm. or something, so um, it's been a long way coming, but now you see it more and more. There's almost just, like, too much in the internet now. There's too many online courses. There's so much yeah. stuff to learn, so... That's too much. That's absolutely... Yeah. So when you were kind of leaving school what were your initial plans did you have concept and illustration in the back of your mind was that your main goal yeah i always went in uh, wanting to do something visual i didn't necessarily have to be arts or digital art or concept art mm -hmm. i just wanted to do something with the visual medium right um, and i always loved drawing and always loved doing all these sketches and mm -hmm. characters and, and environments and stuff right but i i always thought that there, were, there wasn't work in that right uh, I always thought, well, I have to pick something that's safe. Because uh -huh. if you want to do this this more fantasy art-related uh, stuff, mm -hmm. you have to be either really good uh, or just be really lucky. Right. And so at the end of when I finished uh, college, or uh, not college, my education and communication systems, mm -hmm. I, I kind of realized that, hey, there is something you can do here. Right. And then I found schoolism. I uh, found some other stuff online. Mm -hmm. And then and it kind of got close, so then I thought, hey, maybe maybe I can try it. Yeah. Uh, so was your so was your first intro into the industry? Um, so you were doing online courses basically to to marry up the skills you wanted for the industry, right? Yeah, that's true. So back then, after I was finished with school, I was working at the tax office, which is completely different. Right. I mean, yeah. Okay. You, you can barely picture a bigger difference, I think. And I was I was pretty miserable. I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. It's going to make me miserable. Uh, so then I, I started working the least amount of hours I could, possibly. And then I, mm -hmm. I started doing schoolism stuff. So really getting my fun, uh, fundamentals in there and trying to see if I could do it. Um, and I worked really hard on it. And after, I think, maybe two, two years of doing this, I, I started mm -hmm. uh, just freelancing. Right. Okay. So was that like a so just a solid two years of drawing and painting? Yeah. So what I would do is I would work from most of the time from eight to twelve in the morning. And then I would be free for the rest of the day. And then I would just draw like entire days. Right. It seems I mean it seems crazy now that uh that it's uh it only took you two years. I mean for a lot of guys it will take like you know sometimes five to six but then of course you were just hardcore it, right you were just drawing as much as yeah. you could so um was this was it any specific course that you felt tipped the balance or anything you you maybe learned that you felt was was it just like a i'm trying to think of like i'm maybe trying to get the specifics of your learning you know like what you were maybe doing maybe no daily but maybe week to week month to month like was there certain things you were focusing on or yeah well first of all i wanted to do the basics uh, so the first one I did was um, Digital Painting by Andrew Howe, which I think is still on Schoolism. So that taught me some kind of uh, like some basic techniques and some some uh, ideas on how to approach uh, a painting. But then what was really, uh, really important to me, really uh, changed it, was uh, Color and Light by Nathan Fawkes. Yeah, yeah, Nathan's, oh God, I got to meet him at Lightbox in, in September and... Uh... Yeah, he's he's a master of his craft. Definitely, it's you know a lot of people talk about that lighting color courses. It's almost a companion to uh, James Gurney's book, the uh, lighting color as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had that as well. I, th I had that as a as a side. Can I cover to cover? Yeah, yeah. And that taught me most of the the basics on how to use like um, values and how to use color and light and different color palettes and stuff. And that was really the kind of the start of me building my fundamentals, fundamentals. And my pillars right yeah exactly so you were taking so throughout those two years were you taking like any work on at all outside of kind of practice or was it just purely just 
head down on the grindstone. I didn't take much work also because I wasn't very good back then. Okay. <laughs> it was just really, really uh, crappy. Okay. Uh, crappy stuff. Right. But what, what happened when I was, when I, um, when I started doing it, mm -hmm. started do learning this stuff, mm -hmm. I also realized that if you want to get work, you need to network in some capacity. Right. Okay. So what I did was I, I approached a local game development community, like very right. small, maybe like um, 15 people or, so, or something. Okay. And I just uh, asked them, like, hey, can I, what are you working on? Maybe I can help or something. Um, and, and they asked me to, to come over to work at their offices, you know, as a, as a freelancer. It, it wasn't paid or anything. It was just, hey, you want, you want a, a spot to, to work with us experience and you know, kind of getting your foot in the door exactly. and yeah i mean and i think that's yeah i was going to say i just i think that's one of the key things that has helped me definitely it's just been the net amount of networking i've done but also just the fact that sometimes you're willing to do things for free um i mean i see that now but i think it was a couple of years ago i got my first shot at working on a game uh mask assemblance and you know at the time i was like oh, i need to think about you know how much i'm going to get paid because i need mm -hmm. to pay my bills but now at this point I'm like you know as long as i have enough money to to pay the, the little bills I have everything else is fine I'm quite happy just to work on stuff mm. for free and I think it is it's, it's a it's an unfortunate part of the industry but I think initially you have to be able to put yourself out there as a freelance agent for free and then you know after you've done some work that can be measured then of course you can come back and then think well now I mm. want to be paid for it but yeah that initial putting yourself out there is is something that not a lot of people will probably do so um yeah perhaps yeah I think there's that. I think there's something to be said about um, uh, pursuing things that teach you stuff more so than that that give you money. Yes. Like uh, that, this, what what you just said about if if I have enough money and I can afford it, that's been my my go-to approach. I think even now, where I, I'm not, I don't really spend that much money, uh, so I can I can hold out for quite some time if I don't have any paying jobs, and that gives me a lot of freedom. They kind of pick the ones you want to work on. Exactly, and also uh, I can I can pick the ones that I think will teach me stuff. Yes, that are more that are more uh, impactful to your career exactly. or something that you feel will yeah. will push you forward. Yeah. So then it was that was your kind of first smaller company you worked on. Was it like a was that quite a big dev at the time, or was it just a kind of small indie dev? Or oh, it was actually a couple. Of okay. Devs. Um, some students as well that just graduated from game design. Mm -hmm. Uh, schools right uh, i think there were like three or four companies that are actually were actually already doing work okay right um, and so they they would often just approach me because i was pretty much the only artist back then right uh, and they would approach me like hey can you do something simple for us like this right and i would do it it wasn't the pay wasn't like super good it was i think pretty minimum wagey okay right yeah uh if if, if there was even a, any pay <laughs> but it was good enough like back then i was like oh I'm, i can make something out of this this is a good start right yeah i mean like as long as you're you're kind of paying your rent or you're you're able to afford like a loaf of bread then you're quite happy just to be content yeah. with with what you've got so um yeah so so then you were kind of moving through these end devs what was your first kind of I suppose your big break, like maybe like your first, maybe major production you worked on or something that was, was, was that Spider-Man for you or was there some before that? Yeah, I think I would be Spider-Man. Uh, right. Because okay. I'd worked on like many different projects before, but most of them were pretty indie, pretty small time. Like there were Kickstarter stuff or something or a portrait for somebody. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think Insomniac was my big, where I realized like, oh, I did it. I, I, yeah, it's a major, major yeah, kind of publisher exactly. contacted me, and I'm working for them. So, so was that specifically through networking? Was that through an event, or that was actually just luck? Well, okay. luck and and because uh, I asked uh, the art director of uh, Insomnia, Jacinda, I asked her later, "How did you find me? Why did you approach me?" And she said, "Well, basically, I went to Art Station. I looked for a portrait artists, and I saw one of your portraits, and I thought, well, maybe this guy can do it." oh cool well, i mean like so well, that was yeah that is huh? that is a very uh that doesn't happen every day right just somebody just no. like, looking for you and finding something really randomly and yeah that's that's crazy i mean like but then i think art station in a sense is a good uh thing for you know a good system for that where um you know even when a you know, people are looking for talent i know that even now in, like in the search bar you can search specifically by discipline by country by city you live 
whatever. So, I mean, it's a great tool for finding work, work, people to work with and companies to work for. So, so then you were kind of contacted them back in the day. Um, well, this would have been before the game was released. So I'm trying to remember now, was it last year or 2018 it was released? I think it was, yeah, I think it was 2018. Yeah. So, I mean, an instance then, you know, they would have contacted you a while before that, I'm assuming, or a little, maybe, you know, 12 months to a year, or was it was it kind of last minute, or? How do you mean? Before the... Before the game was released, like, were you working on it, like, maybe in 2017, 2016, were they contacting you that far back to work on Spider-Man? Yeah, I think it was um, in 2017 somewhere, uh, because they were, right, okay. they were, like, planning ahead, and they said, it's not, it's a very flexible position, you can just take your time. I'm like that's okay. good, so I can take extra time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I'll just take as much yeah. time as I need. But no, but that's good though as well because I mean they're a bit, very big publisher. Obviously, got huge exactly. deadlines. So yeah. the fact that, the fact that the pressure wasn't really on you. Well, of course it was, but not as maybe as as intense as you thought it was going to be initially. So. Yeah, it was. It was actually one of the most most chill jobs I've ever had because mm -hmm. uh, she would just uh, our director would just say, "Oh, we need this and this," mm -hmm. and not even give me a time where it had to be finished. She would right. just kind of trust me, like, oh, I'll, I'll work on this uh, when I can, as soon as I can. And All then right. you know, send updates and stuff. So, yeah, it's, I think having this uh, experience really taught me on how a good, the good side of the, like, a AAA art industry. Yeah, I was going to say, because a lot of people have these fears, I think especially when American companies contact you on the bigger AAA scale, that you're going to be um, hounded for, for deadlines mm -hmm. or you're going to be wrangled in and, and made to do certain things yeah but, massive crushes um, or uh, crunches uh, yeah of course and i have heard from i mean i actually done a a mentorship like a kind of 3d uh tutorial thing with ryan benno who is one of the environment artists at insomniac and he talked about how you know he just loves it there he thinks it's one of the the best studios he's ever worked at it's a very chill atmosphere um they've just moved to a new studio so um they're kind of setting that up or well have been setting that up before the virus but um, but yeah, he was just saying he just loved the whole vibe of, of working there and loved the people. And um, it's very rare. You hear that in a lot of big studios, um, people really loving where they work. So, um, which is a thing we were talking about the other night, actually, about how, um, I mean, my dream's always been Blizzard or, or working across in California. But um, the way the US looks at the moment, it's 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 eerily a bit more uh, a worrying to look at it and, and think about um you know, making a career over there now because, uh, you know, just the way the country is. But um, I think I've been looking more now towards maybe working in mainland Europe or back here in the UK. So, um, but then I think is has that been a, a kind of plan of yours all along? Have you always wanted to work with the kind of bigger American publishers or were you not really fussed? Well, at the start, I think everyone's dream is to work at, at one of the big studios, like uh, work on Assassin's Creed or like at Guerrilla for, for Dutch people. I think Guerrilla, Guerrilla Games is the go-to. This is my goal. Uh, but I learned very soon that um, in, in AAA studios, there's you're just so such a small part of the pipeline. So there's a big chance you just be doing the same thing all all over time. Uh, and and the crunch and the you know the pressures can be really high. So I, very soon I was like, I, maybe I don't really need to be this specific in my goals. But there's also a lot of like mid range studios that are like really good at this. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a few. I mean, uh, one of my friends, Johan, uh, share with Johan. Uh, he was initially at one of his uh, kind of uh, bigger studios when he done his internships. So he was working at EA Dice um, at the time, but then he's now moved on to uh, Shark Mob in, in Malmo right. in Sweden. And um, small studio, maybe smaller to mid size, but then uh, he talks about how the atmosphere there is very different than like working at Dice, for instance, mm -hmm. or any of the big EA projects. Like, he says he prefers that kind of smaller, more intimate uh, studio setting. And I think that's almost something that a lot of yeah. people are, are seeking out now is, is those studios that you feel more at home and like yeah. feel less corporate in a sense because I've always felt with concept art, like when art meets industry, and that's when the creativity goes to die in my eyes. But um, it's a very hard balance to strike, I think, because you know you want to be making a profit. You obviously want to deliver and, and make something that, that keeps the company afloat. But at the same time, you don't want to make everybody feel like they're just shipping things in a, a container, a, a factory almost like experience. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I don't know if that... Well, you want to find something meaningful. Yeah. Also, because if you, if you work in a studio and you can have a say on the creative process and some of the creative right. choices, that to me, that's much more meaningful than just doing a, like a production yeah. line. 
and just get your props out or get your stuff yeah. out. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's there's something for, there for everyone. I think some people love this mm-hmm. this production, mm-hmm. uh, but I just love finding something meaningful in each of these small things. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's not really specifically you would say like oh it's got to be a game or it's got to be you know like you say it's just no. whatever the project is whatever you feel challenges you or, or changes you as an artist or, or makes you look more into your creative process i mean like i know mm-hmm. just checking because i didn't know about it but just checking your art station credits the other night you, you worked on a, a tv production recently right undone that was something that you done yeah. recently so was that a lot different to like say working on spider-man was that similar kind of atmosphere or yeah it was actually very different uh because well mainly because in insomniac i worked directly with the art director i was just working from my home office okay right so i wouldn't really talk to the team much um not at all actually i would just talk to the art director and i would she would just give me stuff to do and give me feedback which was very very relaxed um but then through a network uh through my network i got the, the job at uh, submarine which is in amsterdam which is i think three hours away from my house so i would go there by train once a week um so partly i would also work from home but then i would also go there uh, and just talk to the people and you know have have talks about what would look right and stuff so it, it was much more like a collaboration um and i think the, these kinds of different uh, dynamics are really interesting to me yeah i mean especially when you get a chance to go and speak to people in the flesh and it's a very different yeah conversation to somebody sending an email or just quickly talking to you over you know skype exactly. or discord or whatever yeah that's why i also yeah. met up with uh our director from insomnia i could just in that a few times mm-hmm. because it's just really nice to have a face to the, the person you're communicating with i can imagine but then is but then was she she was from the us right so she was working in um the studio in america or was she local to netherlands as well, well she's she's uh working in in burbank in uh, los angeles uh, but she would she would come to like gamescom uh, in germany oh, okay so right yeah. there ah, right. she would also come to amsterdam to visit gorilla and then i'm like oh maybe we can have dinner or something oh, cool. yeah fantastic oh that's really nice yeah which is great because i mean yeah like that side of the world is a trek to get yeah. across and and meet most of our european brethren like it's i mean when i went out to lightbox i think i was like i think it was like something like nearly 12 hours to uh chicago and then like another four hours to lax so um it was it was a daunting flight to say the least and then coming back was even worse obviously like it was just oh my god so um so yeah so and then uh, did you get a chance to go out to Insomniac Games in, in Burbank? Did you get to visit the studio at all over there? I was or? actually planning to. It's funny that you mentioned it. Right. Because uh, I, let me check the date. Yeah, I would have been there right now if it wasn't for uh, oh, the pandemic. The I was planning to go there for a month, like uh, the, the area, and visit my brother who lives there as well. Okay, right. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I just visited the studio and I was, I was uh, looking for maybe going to um, Concept Design Academy in LA ah okay right interesting yeah i've always wanted to visit um brainstorm yeah, out there yeah. as well that uh too. like it seems, it seems like a really good school um i, I never got a, i never got a chance to visit uh gnome on either when i was across there. i really wanted yeah. to but um i, I never knew they didn't they'd done tours and then i think it was coming back somebody was like oh you know you can just could have just went in and saw the main kind of visit area they would be like <laughs> yeah and i was like oh shit i never knew um but i got to visit both blizzard and riot oh, games so cool. that was like you know that was good yeah. good enough for me so um but yeah like uh so uh, again interesting when it comes to talk about like your foundations your fundamentals your training the, the jobs you've done i take it are you still pursuing i mean like should be a question obviously but i mean you probably are obviously still pursuing more skill sets but uh i noticed you've done more uh vr stuff recently as well sketch wise is that something you're now trying to integrate into your pipeline yeah actually i i partly already did uh put it in my pipeline right and this is this is what we talked about before where it's really nice to um be able to learn and take that time and and not be picky about stuff uh because at this point i'm in such a position that i can just uh do my own stuff if i want i don't really need to to get jobs to to, like pay my rent and stuff because i'm I live very cheaply. Let's let's put it that way. <laughs> I don't spend much, uh, but that gives yeah. me a lot of freedom to just try and find ways to to learn more and get better. Of course, and just take jobs yeah. that yeah. are that are appealing to me. Um, so right, I'm okay. still doing some like small jobs for animation studios, like set design and stuff. Some some posters, like illustrations, 
but it, most of my time now goes to like experimenting and in, improving my skills. And then later I'll just, I'll see where I end up. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But, but then I, I think it's good though also that you push that, that fundamental idea of always improving, always changing, always moving forward, yeah. especially with VR, because I think it is now so accessible to people that it, it, it's almost, uh, it's like when people were using 3D initially in concept or photo bashing and, you know, there was some people who were like, oh, you know, that's, you know, that's not for me or whatever. But then mm -hmm. I, I think anything that can free up your creativity and push your ideas without any more constraints, I think is always something you should be open to, especially. Um, yeah. Are you are you using the the Quest or, or what VR unit are you using at the moment? Well, I'm using the uh, Oculus S, I think. Like the, I think that's the newest one. I don't, I'm not sure. Right, okay. Yeah, no, just, I was just interested because uh, um, at Lightbox, uh, Yama was uh, showing off the, the Quest, which is great because it's it's like a wireless thing. So, you know, there's no cameras or setup or anything. You literally just put the headset on and grab the controllers and you're in it. Um, yeah, the one I have is the only difference uh, is that there's a wire coming out of the back. Right, okay. And I just put it in my, in my pocket and that's... Yeah. That's all good. Yeah. yeah. So. No, it was. I think it was just more interesting because uh, where we were at the time, there was nothing around us. But then he had it just in a small case, you know, and could just bring it out and use it whenever. And uh, oh, I think yeah. that's such a. Free, it's almost like carrying a sketchbook with you in essence. Like it's, it's yeah. uh, a very it's... free free thing. So, so then interesting as well that you're doing more animation stuff. Um, I've always found that I don't know why, but I think I've always seen your stuff as more animation focused. I think the stories you tell or the world you've created, in my eyes, spark more enthusiasm and imagination for animations. Is that something you would want to do more of in the future as well? Yeah, that's actually where I'm, where I'm going towards. Um, right. More animation heavy stuff. I love doing uh, color key work. So that's very simple stuff based on like me moods and colors, which doesn't have to be very detailed. But it just it adds so much to, to a scene if you have interesting color schemes and stuff. Yeah, of course. Keyframe stuff is like, I mean, so huge. I mean, even back uh, when I think some of the initial stuff I saw Maché doing, Maché Katera, and he was doing a lot of keyframes for like a lot of the Marvel stuff. Um, and then a lot of uh, Andy Park's work. And, and now, of course, uh, Diana's working over there as well. But um, like that stuff is just, I think, so moving, so energetic, so full of life. Um, and I think even like there was one you put out recently was... Um, test flight it was like two characters yeah like that for me was like something i would have seen like sitting in an art book for like dreamworks or disney or, or pixar so uh, it feels very at home for those kind of things so um is that also like a, a small like dream as well like the bigger animation studios in america like the you know dreamworks pictures and stuff like that is that something you would want to cross over in eventually yeah i'd love to, to to try that uh of course it depends on like how what the work load is and how how they're treating people and stuff like we talked about before uh but yeah i'd, I'd love to work on a more more feature film stuff um more animation because i think there's a, there's a big difference between uh game arts and more animation type arts yeah uh, definitely and, and like animation art is much more expressive i, I feel because yeah game art is you're trying to capture that gesture right exactly yeah and that's also yeah. that's maybe nice to bring in the vr again because uh when i was confronted with maybe the idea that i have to go and, and learn 3d for my process mm -hmm. i was like oh i don't i don't not sure if this works for me because it's also very rigid and takes so long and it's mm -hmm. not very interesting at the start uh, but with, right. with vr you can basically use your 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 shapes in the, in the motion you make with your body to make mm -hmm. these models is makes it makes wow. them very cool. much more interesting right away i think kind of fill the life almost animated at the start and yeah. then yeah i know it was almost always incredible when we saw uh goro uh fujita when he was doing some of the demos at thu on uh quill, yeah. quill i think mm -hmm. was, was the soft which is great because they have kind of animation built in it so he was always doing these um even before thu he was doing these 30 minute sketches where he was taking a, a break at lunch and he was drawing something every day and uh like the coolest shortest animations but the fact that he could make them in such a small time frame you know with so little constraints was incredible to, to see and now obviously now he's, he's doing even greater stuff and quill has came on leaps and bounds but i think it's definitely getting to a point where um even with unreal you know unveiling their new system and all that like it's getting to a point where like you know imagination is like your only limit in your work you know as long as you have 
certain tools you can make anything you want there is no there is no uh what's the word there's no limit basically yeah. to what you can create so that was actually yeah. one of my my uh, reasons for getting a vr set so i was watching goron i was I, I was talking to him actually on uh, in paris mm-hmm. at the imic right. uh, festival and i was like i want to i want to see if i can use this so then i also tried quill uh, but that was like you said much more uh, animation focus much more about movement uh, and I'm, I'm still making like still pictures um, so I had to deviate a little bit, but yeah, Goro's work is a, a big inspiration in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What was the, what's the, or what's the program you're using at the moment and what specifically are you using for your, your 3D stuff? Uh, right now I'm using Gravity Sketch. Okay. Interesting. Which is, which is, yeah, it's really nice because it makes simple shapes. Right. Uh, and I want to make my, my um, images, I want to make them from a base of something simple and readable. Right, and then work from there instead of making something very complicated. I wrote a blog about this. I'm not sure if you have you seen this. Like, yes, sure. yes. I kind of I broke it down. Uh, I think a week or two ago when I was kind of reading through it, just about your, your breakdown of how you made your three D shapes and painted over the top and yeah, yeah. But which is a process I've been using actually recently. There was a a piece I posted um, literally only yesterday. I, I kind of I sketched out a, a, or illustrated a, a sulfurous the Ragnaros's hammer from Warcraft. Uh-huh. Um, but I built the three D base in Maya first, and then posed and lit it um, before I started painting. So, like a lot of information was already there yeah. before I, I'd laid down my layers. So, um, so yeah, like I mean, I've definitely known about the process of how good three D is for overpaints for a while, mostly because I've done three D initially in my career. So now right, yeah. moving to two D, it's uh, it's almost like a natural thing where. You know, I thought those years of, of doing 3D was going to be a waste, but in fact, it's actually helping my painting more and more. So yeah. um, it's definitely, I think, a, a key step in a lot of people's careers now, especially for concept and illustration, is that um, 3D photos, whatever you need, mm-hmm. you know, VR, everything's a tool. You know, your foundations are always key, exactly, but yeah. the way you express those can change. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting. But then is that a thing you... I don't know how you feel about using... The, I mean, because people will say, I mean, uh, actually, probably most people who aren't in the industry will usually say, you know, 3D seems like it's, it's cheating or you're skipping a step. Yeah. But then um, for us, we understand why it's important and why it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you come across with your work? Or do you feel like people will judge you because of the 3D implementation or do you feel like it's just a necessary step? Well, it's interesting to think about this uh, because you say Mm -hmm. uh, people from outside the industry, uh, they all think you're cheating. Um, But then I think, is it important for those people to to see you in that way, that you're not cheating, that you're actually doing all this? Because I think, um, and this comes back in in how I view networking as well, the most important people... uh, to kind of impress are the ones that are in the industry. So if you if you use 3D and if you use like some kind of cheat, and, but it makes you so much faster, I think people in the industry will actually uh, probably uh, appreciate it more because that will save them money. You know? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think it's interesting to also make that point, although it's obvious to you and me, but there will, will, there will be people who listen to this podcast who aren't in the industry or who are mm-hmm. trying to get in the industry you know, who haven't heard this from a professional because, you know, they think if they don't hear from guys like you oh, or me, yeah. then, you know, it must not be true. But it's a very, anybody who's yeah. listening now, <laughs> understand this. It's a very important step to use 3D in your work, even if you're doing 2D paintings. So, um, I mean, like you can, you're like, you can, in essence, draw perspective and everything from hand because you can do that stuff. But like you said, it's when production then enters the, the, the realm, you have to think about how much time you're spending on something and you can, you know, clog the whole it's mostly not because you're trying to be oh cool look at me because i can do things so fast but you have like a whole studio sometimes waiting on just you so you have to make sure that you're not holding that train up you know and making everybody else late so you know and i think yeah i think there's also something to be said about the way uh, likes and followers are are viewed right now because it looks like um everyone's kind of aiming for oh i want to have some so many followers and so many likes on all my posts then the the most stuff you do for studios, I don't know if you have that as well. It's most mostly technical stuff, like oh, how is this how is this built, and how does this relate to the other thing? Um, and it's it's not interesting to watch, but it's very useful in the pipeline of uh, of a studio. Yes, of course, yeah. And I think that's like you said, it's it's 
you know, I, I couldn't put it better myself when you talked about how your goal isn't it to impress people outside the industry, you're wanting to impress people inside the industry, you know, like say sharing stuff, getting likes, that's all great and everything. But, you know, when you want to work in games, film, whatever, you know, you need to make sure that the people who work on those things see your stuff and are interested in, you know, your pipeline. Whereas if you're doing it for, you know, a stream or whatever, or, or your careers, whatever outside the industry, then sure, use whatever you want. But then most people know that time is money. And, but that also doesn't mean that what you work on will be rushed or it has to be you know of poorer quality because you're not taking the time to draw things like as long as your fundamentals are key and foundations are solid then the 3d is just a tool to assist it's not something that's um crippling like so, like it's holding you up you know almost like you can still do those things without those tools you know it's you know you don't have to rush your work it's just that you know the it makes it just that a little bit 10 percent more perfect you know if you've got exact perspective or your light is very solid then it means those images um breathe a, a new life or, or are you know more enjoyable to look at because the information is so correct yeah exactly yeah i think uh th this is a very tricky part for a lot of artists as well and i i talked to a lot of my friends about this like how if they if they want more more likes and followers on any social media they start aiming their their work towards getting that which is, I think, the wrong way to approach it. I, what I try to do, and I'm trying to be very aware of this, is try to make my work uh, in, initially for myself, you know, to, to challenge myself and do something that I love doing. And then secondly, to maybe be a better part of a production, like be a, fit in there better and show that. And then thirdly is, you know, if people like it, they can like it. Yeah, of course. On, on social media. Yeah, the like, the like is the afterthought. It's not that you're making things mm. for the audience specifically. You're making it for you. But then if people yeah. also like it, then that's just a bonus. That's something extra. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that gets you some, some uh, like, people noticing you. Mm -hmm. That's all good and all. And I know some people who are actually, they're, they're pretty good and they have a lot of following on social media. Right. And they get worked through all that uh, visibility. Yep. Uh, but there's there's different ways to approach it. But the way I do it is just make sure I I enjoy it first, and then mm -hmm. see if I can put it in a production somewhere, and see mm -hmm. if production people like it and appreciate it, and then the people outside. Yeah, comes kind of secondary to that. But then I think it's also a thing where you initially draw things even before you're in the industry, right? You're not even technically drawing things for industry. You're trying to just make things that you're proud of, yeah. things that you think will be worthy of going in your portfolio or like you know you post so many sketches up and then eventually you make something you're like oh, i'm really proud mm -hmm. of that i really like that I enjoy that and then like you said if people then come from companies and they're like we want to now employ you that you're like oh that's great yeah. you know i made that for me but the fact that you want to give me money for it now is even better so um i think even leon said that at one point when we were talking about you know how they get in the industry and stuff like that and he was he just basically said because we we're talking about him using um cinema 4d and doing his overpaints and he was like yeah man like i just i just made things until, <laughs> yeah. I, until eventually somebody wanted to pay me for it so like you know there's yeah. no there's no hard and fast secret like there's no science behind it you just keep making things and then eventually somebody will pay attention to you so yeah. um i think it's, it's yeah of course there's also like a, a, a modicum of uh, luck involved and some kind mm -hmm. of networking that people actually get to know you because uh, communication and how you appear and stuff is also important for people to see. Yeah. But in the end, it's, yeah, just, yeah, it's just doing what you love and, and showing that you love it. Yes. And, and just keeping yeah. it up. Um, yeah, definitely. I think if you've got to, it's something you've got to try and keep with you throughout the whole industry because um, it's also the reason why a lot of people will do personal art because, you know, if you get tied into a big studio or you're doing work mm -hmm. all day that's, maybe like the opposite of what you really love to do then you have to find the time outside of your work to do those things because that's like your creative sanity you know you're the things you want to do aren't always the things that people will want to pay you to do you may be like oh well we want to pay you but we don't want you to make this specific thing we want you to make something else so you still have to have the creative outlet where you're you're posting you know your stuff up and, and you're still getting i mean like even a lot of your portrait stuff that you've done that's um you know maybe not specifically for work but it's just something that you love to do right it's something that, you yeah want. that's exactly it yeah. and i i a lot of people just kind of tell me like portraits don't belong in a professional portfolio oh. but i just love doing them and i think they look good yeah uh, and so it's fine you know uh, and i think uh there's a there's a difference in 
how you approach it because when i uh, talk to students and they ask me like oh what should i put in my portfolio you know what should i show right. yeah i usually I, I would say put some some kind of 15 maybe of your best pieces in there right show them uh, sh show the stuff that you love doing so you can get hired to do that instead of uh, posting stuff that you think is needed in the we'll get you work yeah yes yeah it's like a huge thing i think that um we've almost talked about like at length in here but you know um for, to your first point i was going to just quickly say um the whole portrait thing i think is i think portraits of people is great especially if you want to make a career making portraits or doing people i think mm -hmm. it is a free exercise to try and capture somebody's essence in a painting it's almost yeah a test of like you know your skills and and, and if you can do them justice because obviously if you paint something and it's terrible yeah. then <laughs> it's like it's almost an insult to the person you don't want to yeah. show them um because i actually done a i done a, a photo study of uh do you, do you do you know jack if you say if i say jack do you know what i'm talking about like jacqueline natalia yeah, yeah, Tretta. Mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah so i done a i done a painting i'll send you it later um i done a portrait study of one of our recent photos and um I was always totally like nervous, like sent to her, like, oh, I've done a painting, I hope you like it. But she was like, oh my God, I love it, yeah. this is incredible. Um, and I've actually just added it to my art station, even though it's like a study, I've been like, you know, you know what, fuck yeah. it. Like, I really enjoyed doing it. I think it's a really accomplished piece. I don't care. So up it went. I totally get that, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I totally feel yeah on that, the whole portrait side. Um, the second piece I was talking about was doing things and you're, you know, putting things into your portfolio that you feel um will get you a job or will get you work versus doing the things you love and again back to leon's comment you know he was all all he was putting up was things mm. that he loved making and things that he was interested in making and then you know he wasn't putting up maybe orcs in armor or <laughs> whatever but gets you work for specific companies yeah. but like you know like the, the, the thing he was aiming for was like what I, what I like to do what i enjoy to do so i think that's almost a whole conversation topic in oh, itself absolutely. about you know making sure your portfolio because there's guys i know years ago they talked about how um it was a 3d guy and he was like yeah i used to make like guns because they were easy or like things that i thought people wanted to see but i really wanted to make a lot more organic stuff like trees vegetation mm. rocks um and then he got hired at a company where basically they saw his portfolio and then he had to spend days weeks months making rifles and guns and <laughs> flintlock pistols and it was like oh god yeah. i hate this so like yeah it, it's a thing where you really have to be conscious about what you're putting up um especially when you approach jobs being understanding that if you're going to want to make one specific thing you want to make sure your portfolio has the majority of that mm. stuff in it because if you don't then you run the risk of getting hired to do a job that you'll just yeah. you'll not enjoy um and that itself is a, is a defeat for you as a person so Definitely, yeah. I met once. Uh, I met a I met a guy once, and he asked me the same thing. And I was about to tell him the same thing I just said. Right. But he had a uh, very very dark stuff in his portfolio. Right. And I was thinking, like, if you if you keep this up and you love this stuff, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But uh, in the end, studios do have to hire you. So I'm like, right. well, maybe maybe do something in between. So it's very tough because some people are also not that financially uh, capable. They actually need. Uh, continuous flow of, of jobs of course yeah to say. yeah so there's all, always a middle ground but i think uh, in the end you do have to work do this work for more than 40 40 hours a week right maybe maybe 60 maybe more yeah um so you have to keep keep yourself from burning out as well <sighs> yeah burnout that's also a, a really key point i think it's why we have this just generation of people millennials especially like you know we're so burnt out now and so there, you know, mm. there's so much depression in the world i think because you know yeah. the, the grind was like all the people focus on for years and years and years it was like you know you, you've got to work hard you've got to work crazy hours mm. and get really good jobs and get a house and get a mortgage and but now like i feel we're coming in this age where like you and i have discovered and i think i you know i was i was the complete opposite when i was an engineer because i had a really good job i had really good money you know i easily paid a lot of my bills and could buy whatever i wanted mm. Uh, and it almost bred this like consumer mentality on me where i just kept buying and buying and buying and, and spending my money <laughs> and stuff but now switching phases and i went back to school obviously you know left my my 30 odd thousand pound year a, a job to go back and be a student you know and be dirt poor um and then spend years doing that it's almost taught me the value of not having a lot or not focusing on mm. a lot of material stuff and now you know i'm very content with minimal 
uh, stuff. I say minimal stuff. I still like to occasionally buy the odd statue, but like, <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. we all? Don't we all? Um, but yeah, uh, the more uh, materialistic stuff is like, I'm not really too bothered about, you know, fancy clothes yeah. or a car or whatever. It's it's just, I would rather be happy inside. And uh, I think like... That's so important. Yeah. I yeah. think we, we, what you're saying now is, is also something I've been thinking a lot about recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you know about the, the kind of minimalist uh, uh, approach to this. Yeah, there's where you're just kind of chucking out stuff that you think you don't need. There's a there's another word it for it in Dutch. There's like a there's like a it's like a, a a way of life where like you live off like not a lot or uh, what's that, dear? Zernik. Does that sound? Zernik. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of it's in in the lines of thrifty or uh, right. You don't really need that much, right? Okay, uh, yeah. That's exactly kind of how I how I like to live. Yeah, because because the world is so big right now, and there's so much coming at you. Mm-hmm. You don't yeah. need all these all these things, all these uh, things trying to get your attention, right? So I just try and keep it somewhat manageable, mm-hmm. and then know know what I own, what I have, yes, know what I love, uh-huh. and if I if I keep all this like um, in in my in my view, in my perspective, right. you don't lose anything. I think that that keeps me sane in the end. Yeah, definitely. I think it's. I mean, I remember one of my friends. Uh, she had a, a philosophy where she wanted to be able at any point to pack up her life into one suitcase and then leave. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I think that's where we're getting to. You know, especially when I used to watch a lot of travel bloggers or, or people who would you know do a lot of trips around the world or you know go mm. go explore or, or do other things they were always able to just like pack their life into one bag um yeah. and just move with the current and i think that's sometimes a better mentality or a way of living um you know like you see people now who like make homes out of cabinets or or the oh, home, yeah, yeah, like traveling the world in, a, in an old school bus that they've retrofitted with couches and stuff and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like the life it's like we all, we all want that kind of life right it's 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 yeah. it's always a balance and i think it's great especially if you do uh 2d concept specifically or in 2d visual development because um the world's your office in essence right you can kind of as long as you've got a laptop or a computer or something to draw on or an ipad whatever um mm-hmm. you can you can pretty much do anything i mean i know one of the guys we saw at industry workshops um do you know rich carey at all rich uh no it doesn't ring a bell yeah so rich was he was a, a really good uh, amazing artist in fact at, at creative assembly for a lot of years working on all the total war stuff and um oh. he actually was originally a 3d catcher artist and then moved over to concept by kind of teaching himself uh drawing and painting as well so he, he switched oh, that's cool. roles it was incredible but then he left a couple of years ago creative assembly to just kind of freelance and then i think it was 2018 um he just was like he took his ipad pro and he was like i'm going to japan just left <laughs> went to japan um because they have a thing like if you're under 30 you can and if you can sustain yourself you can go and yeah. st- you can go and stay there for a year you don't have to get like a specific visa or anything you can just go and get like an extended tourist thing um mm-hmm. and now he's kind of like been there enough times that he's he's you know learning the language he's trying to get into the culture and i think he's eventually going to try and work across there but then he's done all uh his concept work and all his work for Riot Games uh, the last couple of years just from his iPad Pro. Um, yeah, so, that's amazing. Solely in Procreate. So it's it's one of these things where, like, yeah, if you just want to get out and explore the world, then, you know, there's more and more opportunities to do that now. Um, mm-hmm. Makes me really fucking jealous of them, though, because yeah. <laughs> God damn what I wouldn't give to be uh, touring Japan right now. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's... It could still happen. Yeah, I, I mean, totally, man. Like, the you know, the, whatever. I mean, I, I'm moaning a great, but I'm 35 in August, but um, people always say that, you know, age is nothing in this industry. And Yeah, who cares? Yeah, exactly. Nobody gives a shit. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so then, uh, moving forward uh, into, like, you know, the future of your career, obviously, you can't talk about specifics of maybe things you're working on, but is it like you know something where you feel like there's a there's a goal for you at the end of it or there's something you want to achieve moving forward or your kind of next like mantle or next step up is there something that you're aiming for or is it just to continue just making awesome art yeah i think that's that's one of the main things right uh, but i do have a, a personal project that i'm working on okay um which like so the first goal in that sense is to finish that right uh, after that i want to work for more animation type stuff okay you know for for feature films or animation in general right and it's all pretty open uh, right i don't really have any specific plans yeah. uh, to see where it goes but as long as i can uh, apply my skills mm-hmm. in a in a, an environment that is challenging to me and mm-hmm. 
like teaches me stuff mm -hmm. uh, and that, that has nice people because that's i think also very important yes that's that's pretty much all i need yeah because i don't i don't really mind uh not working for the bigger studios right i just want to be doing my stuff yes with the cool people in a in a nice environment and that's enough for me right yeah okay and as and as also uh you know just even on the subject of travel we're talking about you know you've been in amsterdam is it something you would want to maybe try and get out and see other parts of the world and, and work in different areas as well or yeah i'd love to do that yeah um and i think i could as well because like you said uh, the, the 2d art world is very you can do it anywhere you want if yes. you have the, the gear you can take with you yeah I'm not a very seasoned traveler in that sense. Okay. You know, I, I went to some some, uh, some uh, art events and stuff. Right. And that's all good. But living in a different country, that's kind of new. It's a different thing altogether. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a could. I, I would love to do it, but it would be a big challenge for me. Yeah, I know. I'm a I'm a nicer. I'm a good hermit. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say because there's there's all these. Uh, I remember seeing was it a year back or a couple of years ago there was these videos of people who were moving to like um like Bali and other places where oh yeah it's like ridiculously cheap to live like it's almost pennies per week to live in some places and uh you know these yeah, guys so... are getting thousand two thousand dollars a month and uh they're just like living like kings across there so <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's... digital nomads right you call them yeah yeah exactly that's what it is yeah and I think that's what a lot of us can also do now because you're living in this industry in this time where people are um very switched on to technology and are very aware mm. like a lot of like even like youtubers for example who can now uh tour and blog and do all these things across the world because their right. their skill sets are things that are mobile that things that they can do um you know wherever they want to be whatever they want to be in the world they can just pick up a mm. laptop and, and um and go wherever they want and as long as they're connected to the internet then you know doesn't matter it's it's yeah so yes it's a I very think especially now it's it's much easier to to work remotely because everyone's doing it now and they're realizing that you know you can just do this it's no yeah. problem yeah it's, it's yeah. a it's a very open career it's um i think if you're i mean obviously you've got to put time in like everybody but then if you do then the future of your your work is then very open you know it's hard initially because you're having to learn so much but then once you have those skills once you have that skill set and you have something that's very sellable to a company, then yeah, you can just work yeah. wherever you want. I think it's also a testament to you know companies like One Pixel Brush who you know will hire guys who are like seventeen in like you know um, oh yeah Afghanistan because you know they're they're amazing artists you know and yeah and that's I think that's uh, the key in this that as as long as you're good and you can communicate well yes which I think is also very important mm -hmm. you can get to work anywhere yeah definitely i think as long as you have that i mean people always sometimes they get the question constantly of like like how do i find work or how do i approach people for work and i'm always like the people i know who have work they've never i mean not always but like you know most of them haven't sought it out like if you're good no, enough, yeah well if you're good enough people always feel will find you you know what i mean like you yeah. talked about earlier where you made the portrait stuff that director saw you mm. hit you up for so i mean i feel that's always the case is that don't be worried too much initially about where to find the work or how to get it just focus no, no. on making the work and then the work will come to you so uh, yeah and also network a little you know connect with other artists oh yeah it doesn't hurt awesome. yeah no totally it's, it's i mean yeah. if anybody's listened to my advice over the last couple of years i definitely feel like every opportunity i've been handed recently has came through um going to events and stuff like lightbox yeah. thu initial workshops imag um playgrounds i mean the list goes on there's so many events <laughs> yeah. now but like yeah it's uh, the same for me yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just there's, you meet so many and then you, of course once you start to go initially you start to build this foundation of like a almost like a family mentality you know you're seeing like the same faces every time you're meeting the same mm -hmm. people you grow these friendships you get to know people and um especially you know i think because i spent so many years networking online doing the podcast interviewing people when I got the chance to go to America and, and go to LA, a lot of the guys I caught up with was like, it was the first time I was actually meeting them in person. So, you know, oh, because wow, yeah. I spent so much time talking to them online, it was like, oh my God, how's it going? And <laughs> hugging these guys that I hadn't met. That's so before. cool. Yeah. So it was like, you know, and especially getting to go, you know, Blizzard and meet all the people that I'd networked with there and, and have lunch with them. And oh, it was just so good. So, yeah, I definitely feel like building these relationships online early are really good. Even getting to know, a couple of key people and just keeping them on your radar because eventually when you start making really good work if you're on their radar and they know you very well and you've got a kind of reputation or, or a bottle with them then when you start making good things they can start recommending you for jobs or they can pass something along your way that you might like or maybe good at yeah so, that's 
that's basically how it goes yeah for yeah. me as well i think most of my jobs came through friends that kind of knew what i could do you know right they knew what my strength was mm -hmm. and so they they recommended me to their whoever approached them and they couldn't do it right yeah so yeah, yeah. i think that's uh that's very important yeah. yes yes indeed <sighs> okay a grand note to, to end on it was a very good talk and a very good conversation um thank you again sama for coming on it was yeah of course absolute was pleasure talking to you yeah it was really good um you guys who are listening uh, along in the podcast whatever you're listening to um check us out on all the platforms we're available on which is a lot there's a lot of podcast platforms we're on we're mostly on youtube um where we put a lot of these up as video form as well um if you have any questions for sama you can leave them down below um i'll leave all these links uh, and details if you want to get in touch or ask any questions i'm sure he's always open to that um and then again just hope you guys are doing well um in all parts of the world i know it's a horribly shit time right now for a lot of people but um we're just trying to stay as positive as we can here on the cast and, and hope you guys are all staying safe uh, um, and calm and collected um and again thanks to sama and you guys for listening and uh we'll see you guys later okay bye